Welcome everyone this morning. A beautiful day to come together. And it's wonderful to see every one of you here in the sanctuary. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ and to all of those joining us online. It is wonderful to have you join us and make our circle complete. We have come to worship and we're going to open with our call to worship, which you will see is a litany for ascension. On Thursday, which was just an ordinary Thursday for most of us, we had this year in 2022 assigned for us the celebration of the ascension of the Lord. And so we will make note of that through the service and in the sermon as well. This is a litany in honor or in um, celebration of the ascension. So please join. Arise, O Lord, in your strength. We will praise you for your glory. Let us pray, pray with joy to Christ at the right hand of God, saying, you are the king of glory. You have drawn all people to yourself. Let no one of us be separate from your body. You are the king of glory. May our faith lead us to the Father as we follow the road you trod. You will be our judge. Lead us to contemplate your tender mercy. You are the King of glory. Blessed be the holy and undivided Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Let us stand and sing together in praise of God.
Please be seated. On behalf of Chris Borum, chairperson of the Presbyterian School Play School Board, I'm delighted to share with you a few amazing facts about this very large mission of our church, which includes the children, caregivers, family, and staff of our daycare housed here in our facility. We have about 55 families who entrust their little ones from birth up to kindergarten to our care for as many as 50 hours each week. On a typical week, there are 70 precious little ones coming through our doors. And in the summertime, we care for as many as 11 additional older children up to age eight. Children with all sorts of exceptionalities and gifts are loved and led by our staff of 18 employees. We have children with language problems, special gifts, physical challenges, and three who are currently enrolled with autism. We face both typical and new hurdles on a daily basis, but we also have lots of fun. Our play school allows parents to focus on their jobs to provide for their families. Just how does the play school handle such an important and challenge, challenging business? The underlying reason is that we have a church which prays and stands behind the play school mission. We also have Aretha Davis, our play school director, who has been with us for 18 years. Aretha stays on top of a multitude of governmental regulations, including seeing that our caregivers attend continuing education classes. She oversees all aspects of the school, from hiring staff to managing classrooms, to preparing meals, to working within the budget. And we have a wonderful praying minister who delights in seeing the children of our mission every day. The Presbyterian Play School of First Presbyterian Church asks for your continued prayers for Aretha, the caregivers, our children, and their families. Thank you, Helen. As we have been enjoying these minutes for mission, I know for some of you there's been uh, a new understanding of some of the things that we do that perhaps you did not know about before. Some of these come under the mission committee and some do not. Someone has said very wisely, everything a church does is mission. And I do believe that that is true. The play school is a very important one, and we are so blessed to have it. As we think about offering our lives in the work of the church, notice that in your bulletin there are several announcements about things going on. This week, not much about next week and the next, but there will be things for you to see in the bulletin and perhaps in messages throughout this week. But please know that work goes on even on a day when we are closed, which will happen Monday, tomorrow, as the uh, school, play, play school as well as the church will close for Memorial Day. Throughout the week, between Sundays, there are things that you can take part in. So I urge you to begin to think, if you're not already, thinking about things that you might do to be a part of the missions of this church. Let us turn now to a time of confession as we do in this time of our service in order to ask God to cleanse us so that we will be more prepared to hear God's holy word. In humility and faith, let us confess our sin to God. In the unison prayer of confession all together, Loving God, you have shown yourself to us in Jesus, perfect in every way, compassionate and kind, faithful and loving, gracious, 
hospitable, open, while you direct us to follow in his way and embrace the qualities of his living, we confess that in our own lives we have stumbled and fallen. Our sins are real. Forgive us, we pray. Encourage us to start again, trusting that what we have seen in Jesus is true and that nothing, not even our sin, can separate us from your love. We know that this is a time when we can be certain in our very day-to-day -day lives of the promise of God. Who is in a position to condemn you? Only Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came to live for you, to die for you, to be raised for you. And now he, li he lives reigning in power at the right hand of God. Jesus Christ prays for you every day. You are in him made a new creation. The old life has gone and a new life has begun. So know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Let us stand to give glory to God for this gift of salvation. As those who are forgiven through Christ, let us not fail to forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all of you today. And also with you. You may greet each other from the pews. It is wonderful to see both of you today. So pretty and dressed up. Look at all your jewelry. You like to wear jewelry, don't you? Yes. Well, today, in our reading uh, from Scripture, the Gospel lesson tells us about a prayer that Jesus gave when the disciples were with him, and he prayed for them a certain prayer not the one that we call the Lord's Prayer. That is one that Jesus gave for us to pray together. You know how we say our Father together? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so that is another prayer. But Jesus has taught many prayers, and the one he taught that day is going to uh, remind people that God is one with him, and God is one with us. God wants us to be, you might say, getting along with one another. 
every day. So we are just like people who want to live together in peace. You know what that means? And not fuss or fight with one another, but always live peacefully together. It is not always easy, is it? It is not. Sometimes you get hurt by someone or someone makes you angry and you just want to lash back. But you know what Jesus says? Mm -mm, no, no. Instead of doing that, you just say, I don't think that was very kind, but I'm going to be kind to you anyway. Oh, that is sometimes so hard to do. But Jesus prays for his disciples in a very sweet way, asking God to make them completely one. And that is a really tall order. That would mean for the whole world to be united in loving Jesus and in following him. One day that's going to happen, but we're a long way from it right now. But every time you turn to someone else and say, I'm sorry, you are working toward that time when the world will all be better and at peace with one another as we're at peace with God. So let's have a prayer about that. Dear God, Dear God, thank you for Jesus, thank you for Jesus and, all and all he teaches about peace, about, peace, about, love, about love, about faith in you. About faith in you. Thank, you for this day. thank you for this day. Help us to be kind, Help us to be kind in, this in this day and every day. We pray in Jesus' name. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Good. Let us pray. Heavenly, Heavenly Father, we pray that your written word of Scripture may now and always be our rule, your Holy Spirit our teacher, and your greater glory our supreme concern. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First, a reading from Acts. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, these men are slaves of the most high God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days, but Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. <clears throat> but, when, but when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrate, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About, mid, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. 
when the jailer woke up and saw the prisoners, the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for the lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in, the, in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced that he had become a believer in God. A reading from Revelation. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let everyone who hears say, come. And let everyone who is thirsty, come. Let anyone who wishes takes, <clears throat> take the water of life as a gift. The one who testifies to these things says, surely, I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with all the saints. Amen. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Stand now for our second hymn. Please be seated. Our gospel reading from John. <clears throat> Hear the word of the Lord. As you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself so that they also may be sanctified in truth. I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. As you, Father, are in me and I in you, may they also be one in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me I have given them so that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, 
that they may become completely one so that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory, which you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It was perfect timing, even though it was an earthquake, and it's an unusual thing to say, perfect, when it has to do with an earthquake, which is always a disaster. But look at what happens that night at Philippi. The earthquake came at midnight. Tremors caused the foundations of the jail to shake so violently that the chains fell off those who were imprisoned there. Paul and Silas were among the prisoners. Perfect timing, it turns out to be. The two missionaries were carrying the gospel to the people of this city, Philippi. They had been locked up for healing a woman who was possessed. But the story would not end there, far from it. Paul and Silas were singing hymns and saying prayers, and the other prisoners were listening to them. What is going on here? Some of the best kind of evangelism we Christians can practice is showing faith in the midst of the worst kind of trial, and that's what they were doing. In this case, the trial might have ended in stoning of the two missionaries, but instead it ends with a happy event of another Philippian family being baptized. Last week we read of Lydia and her family converted and baptized. And this year, or this week, we read of the jailer and his family being converted and baptized. The early Christian church was growing. It was growing as God had hoped it would and had decreed that it would, all in God's good time. It's important for us to consider God and his timing when we look at our lives today and sometimes wonder where God is and what's going on in our lives that has to do with God. God's time is unpredictable. It pierces our life at unexpected times and moments show us something that God hopes we see that maybe otherwise we wouldn't if we weren't looking for ways that God is in our lives. It offers us a glimpse of God when he enters our life in a surprising way. It shows us his control of the world, and it actually gives us hope and comfort to know God is in charge. He has power over our lives, and he has love and care always ready for our lives. In the gospel reading, we hear Jesus tell the disciples about the time that is going to come when he will no longer be physically present. He will be out of their lives in the way that they're accustomed to seeing him day after day. He prays that they will understand what it means, that he leaves his glory for them, his love, his power, and yes, the unity that will reflect the Godhead, the unity of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, always self-giving love, communicating among the three persons of the Trinity, constantly exchanged love, constantly renewed love. God's will for the world is revealed through Jesus, particularly God's will that all people hear the word, believe, and worship 
Christ as king. All people, one day, Jesus points out in his prayer, will be bathed in the glory that is the glory of God. Jesus includes in this remarkable prayer that we're reading this morning from John's gospel at the very end of the prayer, these words, I ask not just on behalf of these disciples that I have with me now, but also on behalf of all of those who will believe in me through their word. His prayer is not just for the evening he is spending with his first disciples, it's for every generation afterwards. He will be drawing disciples to himself every generation after. Hear the words of Jesus' prayer again. I in them, you in me, that they may become completely one. Those words are a little tricky, and they sort of bounce around in our brain a little bit. They're a little difficult to take in right at first, reading them first, hearing them first. I in you, I you in them, they will be completely one. What is going on here? The ultimate goal of unity, Jesus is seeking on behalf of the Father who sent him into the world so that all the world could be saved through him. Again and again, Jesus is saying to whoever listens, his disciples and all of those gathered around, all people are called to believe in me. The last line of his prayer is this. I made your, known, your name known to them, and I will make it known so that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The disciples that evening, that same evening, will be the same disciples who will be present when Jesus ascends on the day we call Ascension Day, 40 days after his resurrection. Thursday, as I said earlier, this past Thursday was the day in this year when it was celebrated or noted in our church calendar. In the gospel lesson today, Jesus is preparing the disciples for just such a day as Ascension Day when he would physically leave the disciples. If you have time to read the story of the Ascension, it is well worth the little while it will take you to read the first chapter of Acts, the first 11 verses, will tell you what it was like that day when Jesus gave final instructions to them, which pretty much summed up everything he had said to them. The Holy Spirit is going to come and give you power, and I'm telling you, you know what to do. I have prepared you for this, so go and do and be ready for the Spirit to take you and lead you into the work that is ahead. We are not to imagine, as the angels uh, and Jesus himself tell the disciples that day of the ascension, we're not to imagine when the time will be when Jesus will come again. But one of the things you will read in those first verses of Acts is the disciples questioning Jesus, well, does this mean it's time now for you to come? Is this, is this time now when you will reign? Will you, you take the throne now? They haven't quite gotten it yet. They don't know that he is about to disappear from their sight. But Jesus says, no, and that time is not for you to know. And God, the Father, is the only one who does know. We are not to imagine when the time is coming. It's for God alone to know. In that first short narrative in Acts, Jesus says, you will receive power. In the story of Paul and Silas in the prison, we see that power that Jesus has provided through the Holy Spirit for all who carry the message that Jesus is Messiah. The power that God gives the church has that divine purpose of continuing to tell the world that Jesus is the Son of God that Jesus came into the world to save the world and to demonstrate to the world the love of God. 
in the stories we read in Acts, such as today's story, we find ourselves witnessing a new era of Christianity. Jesus is no longer present. The work that he modeled for his disciples now is up to them, and they learned well. We are surprised when we read Acts that they are showing they knew much more than we thought they did as we read the Gospels and think they're not really getting it, but they do get it. The Spirit fills them full, and they know what to do, and they go out and do it. The disciples on that day, on Ascension Day, though, stood gazing up into the air when they saw Jesus suddenly not with them. And the angels were quick to come and stand with them and say, what are you gazing at? There's work to be done. Go and get busy. This Jesus you loved, your master, has gone, but he will come back. Much work remains to be done, yes. There will be preaching and teaching and healing. There will be spreading the good news all over the world. Trying to be faithful disciples in that generation has moved forward to our generation. Yes, today as then, there is much work to be done. And we still ask, Lord, is this the time? Is it time for you to come? Not yet is the answer we continue to receive. Much work remains to be done. Hard hearts to be softened, evil to be overcome by good, and ugliness to be eradicated by beauty. There are lies that must be overpowered by God's truth. So much to be done before we get to the point that it's anywhere close to the time when Jesus will come again, and we do not know when that will be. In reaction to the ascension of Jesus, a woman who lived about 500 years ago was so moved by this story of the ascension that she wrote these beautiful words. God of love, help us to remember that Christ has no body now on earth but ours, no hands but ours, no feet but ours. Ours are the eyes to see the needs of the world. Ours are the hands with which to bless everyone now. Ours are the feet with which he is to go about doing good. How beautifully said. A command to us in a prayer to God made 500 years ago. The disciples waited, and 10 days after the ascension of Jesus, that wind blew through Jerusalem. The day of Pentecost came and they were blown into the new mission Jesus had for them. The empowered disciples knew exactly what to do, and out they went, and they began that process, which is still ours to continue, of uniting the world in the name of Jesus Christ and letting everyone in the world know all who are thirsty can come. All who want to worship Jesus Christ are welcome. John would have that remarkable experience. We read just the end of the book of Revelation. and We've been reading through it in the last few weeks. John had this remarkable experience that was guided by Christ himself. And in the spirit, he had the vision of what it would be like at the end and so those are the words, some of the words we heard today. Let everyone who is thirsty come, everyone. In that day, when everyone comes to drink from the waters that are flowing through the New Jerusalem, from the throne, the crystal waters with the tree of life on either side, everyone who comes will be satisfied, will be made new. And guess what? We will all be one, completely one, on that day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day today and all the blessings in it. 
and we thank you for the words that you have for us today to remind us that Jesus is here and Jesus is there. You give us a great image of how heaven and earth are connected and what you expect of us and where we know you will take us one day. You give us the light that is your glory to shine all around us as we look and go and serve you in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us to be disciples who will listen to your message and follow, obey, and tell the good news wherever we go. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand now and say the words together, affirming our faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As you have come today with many things in your heart, maybe you have come with people on your heart, names of people, or something going on in your life that you hope God will listen to you about as you pray. Lift those things as we pray together, uh, these prayers for the world and for ourselves as we join together in prayer. Please pray with me. Almighty and gracious God, our Father, you have given us grace so that we together in this place at this time can make our common prayers to you. You've promised through your beloved Son, our Savior, that when two or three are gathered in his name, you will be in the midst of us. Fulfill, O oh Lord, all of those things in our hearts that we pray individually and as we pray as a gathered people. You know what is best for us, and to you we give our very lives in service, ask you to take us and help us to be your disciples. Lord, as we look out on the world, we know that we need to pray for peace and love to replace war and hate. And we know that you will call us to pray for children everywhere. And we do that. And for the children in our own community and in this church as they grow in faith. We pray that you will make us instruments of your gospel to show forth Christ in how we lead our lives. Let us be like those early missionaries, those who will always show wherever we are, in whatever position we might be, in trouble or in peace, to show forth Christ in all we do. We pray, of course, and especially for those who are hurting or in trouble today. Make your loving presence comfort them. May your loving arms enfold them. We ask that you would remember all of those who are listed in our prayer list and you would be with each in whatever need there might be. We ask prayers for ourselves, our families, our loved ones, and ask that you would hear those prayers as we lift them to you this morning. We give you thanks for hearing these words and hearing our silent prayers lifted to you. 
In thanksgiving, we honor you, O God, our Father, and we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus. Hear us as we pray the prayer that he has taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come now to a time of thanksgiving. We will take up tithes, gifts, and offerings. Thank you for your generosity, which keeps going all the missions that you have heard about in the last few weeks. Thank you to those who are online. Thank you for also taking part in generous giving. Let us pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for your generosity toward us and all the blessings that we have enjoyed. Bless these gifts that we are bringing back to you. Bless them to be used in ways that we might show a slight glimmer of your kingdom in this place to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn is 33. <laughs>
thank you for your presence today. Go out and serve the Lord and serve in joy. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord let his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace evermore. Amen. Thank you.